Hi, I'm Seth Anderson, uh, and I'm the Software Preservation Program Manager at Yale University Library. Uh, we're in the Digital Preservation Services Department, um, and as Program Manager, I am uh, primarily responsible for uh, emulation services at the university, both for the uh, university library system, but anyone else who we think could uh, use emulation of their software for access to their digital collections. Um, I'm here today to talk about our recent work, uh, an ongoing work on the easy program of work, um, which uh, is an attempt to make access to and the use of emulation uh, easier. So apologies for uh, bad jokes related to the name of the project. Um, but first, some context. So. Uh, why emulation? I'm sure most of you in the room have considered or heard about emulation uh, recently, maybe. Um, but you know, for over 20 years, uh, emulation has been talked about as a strategy for access to digital information. Um, and then, as that has taken a larger role in our daily life and collections, this has come up more and more. And I think even as of within the last two years, the PI on our project, my boss, Ewan Cochran, was at CNI uh, to do a talk on emulation and kind of the first baby steps that Yale took uh, towards using emulation uh, within the library. Um, but, um, you know, we've pursued emulation because of the, these challenges that digital information has, which uh, is that there is a need for some mediary to actually access digital information. So you can't just look at a file and know what it is. You have to have software and hardware to support the de underlying dependencies uh, of that content. Um, so we require software for content and integri integrity so that we can uh, show or recreate what um, uh, the content of a digital object was without um, unnecessarily corrupting it. Uh, due to changes in the underlying software or modern software. Um, we need software for accurate reproducibility, similarly, but in more of a computational sense. Um, using different software or newer software um, can change the functionality of a digital object. Um, so this comes up a lot with regards to reproducible computational research. Um, if you are not using kind of the native or original software, you might actually change the output or uh, operation of, of that information. Um, and, you know, just at a core basic level, um, we need software to support uh, obsolete formats, uh, file formats. So, uh, of course, as software develops, um, we lose that sort of backwards compatibility that is, you know, supposedly kind of a best practice and a nice thing to have. But um, over the years, we've left a lot of formats by the wayside, um, and accessing the information within those uh, is tricky to near impossible without the original software uh, and some means of, of accessing that software, um, which is where emulation comes in. So we can. Uh, access that software by emulating or recreating uh, in a virtual sense the computing environment that would run that uh, software. So what is emulation as a service, which is what the first four letters of the EASY acronym uh, stands for? Um, so over the years, numerous efforts have focused on facilitating the use of emulation through uh, services, um, so, you know, projects like uh, KEEP, which was a European Union project, um, the OLIVE project at Carnegie Mellon have focused on this. Um, but another related project uh, was started, I think, around 2008 or 2009 at the University of Freiburg. Um, originally was great and then became BWFLA and then finally settled on this emulation as a service moniker. Um, and the work of the team of researchers and developers at Freiburg uh, was focused on creating a framework that enables users to remotely access emulated environments through a web browser. Um, so that instead of having to, one, both have the sort of local infrastructure on your desktop, 
uh, or your, the computer that you use regularly, um, you could instead uh, just go to a, your, your, your browser and, and have an interface that allowed you to generate and use emulators. Um, but also, the software just abstracts the interaction of uh, with abstracts the interaction with the technical elements of an emulator. So you don't have to really have the techn underlying technical expertise to know how to change hardware settings in QEMU uh, or any of the number of other emulation open source emulators that are out there. Um, and instead, the user can focus on the decision making related to what needs to be configured within the computing environment um, to better support the software or digital, digital objects that are really the end goal um, of generating an emulated environment. Um, so emulation as a service um, does a lot of things. Um, it uh, simplifies, as I said, access to various emulators, but um, really is uh, a gateway uh, to using these emulators without any expertise. Um, so all of this is managed in the back end, um, and you don't even really need to know what emulator is being used uh, to generate your, um, your computing session. Um, it also allows you to interact with uh, and manage large collections of emulation environments. So um, you can save uh, many, many, many derivatives of different emulation environments um, and return to them as needed. So instead of having to create uh, your computing environment every time you access it, the software, the emulation as a service software saves uh, your environment and makes it available to you on the fly uh, whenever you have need to access it. Um, and it also manages the generation of the underlying disk images. So all of this is happening in the back end. Um, so as you're creating derivatives of your computing environment, so if I start with one and change things and make a new one and continue to do that over time, um, the system is actually, and apologies, it's really hard to read because of the weird coloring thing that's happening with the projector. Um, the system is managing all of the underlying disk images that uh, make up your computing environment. So instead of um, recreating, let's say, a five gigabyte disk image every time you make a change, it's just doing, it's just saving the deltas between your changes. So over time, instead of having um, what would be, what, like, a, according to these examples, I mean, they're not that large, so... <laughs> Um, a 15, 15 gigabytes uh, on that top row. So every change would result in a, let's say, five gigabyte environment. You actually only end up with about 5.1 to 2, uh, like, or 5.01 to 2 gigabytes because it's just changing blocks within a disk image. Uh, and then it actually manages um, the compilation of those disk images whenever you access that uh, computing environment. So it does a lot in the back end to um, just make life easier on people who want to use emulation. Um, but um, despite all of the wonderful work that the team at Freiburg has done over a decade in maturing this software, um, there are still many, many hurdles um, with actually implementing its scale. So um, Software, you know, can provide as many convenient features, um, but harnessing kind of the community resources and human resources um, and facilitating that as well through software um, it was is needed um, to actually make emulation as a service kind of a viable platform for uh, access to digital objects. Um, so... Enter the Easy Project. Um, due to, f uh, well, thanks to uh, funding from the Mellon and Sloan Foundations, um, we started this work at uh, Yale University Library in January of 2018. Um, 
And the focus or the goal of the project um, was to design, deploy, and scale infrastructure and services for software emulation. So taking what existed as emulation as a service um, and adding necessary tools and infrastructure that would allow it to meet the needs of a broader spectrum of users and stakeholders. Um, so uh, we're focused on this in uh, four main points that are laid out here, um, but they all have sort of underlying uh, deliverables within them. Um, the first was to establish a distributed management framework for um, an easy service. Um, so instead of uh, emulation as a service existing at a bunch of disconnected individual institutions with their own silos, um, we wanted to leverage the growing community around software preservation um, that's been made possible by the Software Preservation Network, um, of which we are an affiliated project. Um, but use that and use similar distributed network framework um, projects um, as a building block uh, for establishing, you know, institutional partnerships um, for management and uh, creation of uh, software collections and emulation environments. Um, so this way we can actually work together um, to address the challenges of software preservation and scaling emulation services. Um, so central to that uh, goal as well is this concept of actually sharing um, resources across that network of, of partners within a, a service. Um, so uh, we are building what we are currently calling the Easy Network, um, which um, is a currently a group of like-minded institutions who are um, using the Easy software um, to share resources between with each other. Um, so instead of many, it's like as I said, many institutions having their own siloed software collections, uh, using the Easy software, we can all pool our resources. Um, and exchange installation media between institutions uh, as well as any saved configured emulation environments. So um, we all kind of contribute and gain from uh, the continued use of the uh, easy service. Um, to kickstart the operations or the, the, the use or the usefulness of the easy network, uh, Yale Unis University Library is committed to contributing thousands of configured emulation environments to the institutions who are joining us on kind of the beta or pilot uh, period of the project. Um, and I'll have talk about that a little bit later. Um, what? Oh, wow, I'm already running out of time. Because um, <laughs> I wouldn't have time for Q&A. Uh, we're also focused on improving um, best practices or defining best practices really for documentation of software applications uh, and emulation environments. Uh, one, so that they are easier to discover within uh, our system, um, but also so that we have uh, a broader spectrum of information to internally automate some operations within the software. Um, and just as kind of a community service, we are also planning to contribute as much uh, metadata as we can to the Wikidata body of knowledge so that there's an sort of open and uh, machine readable uh, corpus of data about uh, software and computer history um, that can be used by other services uh, or other researchers. Um, so we're working uh, with Kat Thornton, uh, who has been uh, pioneering this work uh, for the Wikidata for Digital Preservation project um, to incorporate the output of her project in what we are working on as well. Um, and then finally, we are also committed to um, prototyping or piloting uh, services or modules uh, that encourage end user access to students or researchers um, using emulation. Uh, so we have a few different uh, products that we will be building um, towards the end of the project to facilitate this work. Um, so some being related to sharing 
CD-ROMs from general collections, uh, from institution to institution, um, an interface for managing access to special collections materials in virtual reading rooms, um, a portal for uh, facilitating researcher use of emulators to stabilize uh, and recreate their uh, computational uh, research. Um, and then this really big undertaking to generate an API or develop an API that can uh, analyze file formats and select or recommend uh, existing emulation environments uh, and run or sort of pre-render uh, files uh, for users without any sort of underlying knowledge or technical expertise about what their files are. Um, so we have an incredible team working on this project. Uh, at Yale, uh, we have uh, myself as well as um, the um, Director of Preserva Digital Preservation, uh, Ewan Cochran, who's the PI on the project, and Ethan Gates, who uh, is the uh, analyst position underneath me. Um, but we are also working with uh, a number of collaborators. Whoop, that's not good. Um, uh, so developers at uh, OpenSLX, which is an offshoot of the team from the University of Freiburg, uh, who have worked on the emulation as a service software for a long time. Um, recent partners who have joined the project, Portal Media, will be uh, helping, supporting our UX UI development as we kind of pivot towards the front end services that are really important to making the service viable uh, for the end users. Um, Jessica Meyerson of Educopia and Software Preservation Network is uh, contributing uh, as a communications and outreach lead, so helping us engage um, the growing community around software preservation um, and really facilitating our work with the partner institutions that we have engaged on the project. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, Kat Thornton um, from Data Current and the Wikidata for Digital Preservation Project um, is, has been helping us with our metadata and semantic approach to um, describing what we generate in the system. Um, a quick note on the legal context, because this always comes up. Um, we usually get asked, how can you even do this? Um, given that a lot of this is proprietary software. Um, so recent work um, at the University of Virginia, um, which was supported by the Association of Research Libraries, um, focused on the specification or definition of a group of best practices for um, fair use of soft uh, preserved software, um, and specifically included one uh, section on a service similar to what was being developed uh, as easy at the time. Um, and so we see this work as falling under a fair use argument. And um, as long as the institutions and the groups that we work with share our values uh, and are focused on using emulation as a sort of research uh, or, or um, teaching tool, um, we, we feel like we would be within bounds uh, as far as <laughs> copyright regulations go. Um, there has been other work, of course, um, to pursue exemptions from DMCA um, for software preservation and reuse, um, which also gives us some extra leeway uh, to continue this work uh, uh, on the project. So what have we actually been up to? Um, so the project began in January of 2018 and uh, is currently funded for two and a half years. So we'll uh, wrap up in June of 2020. Um, we were lucky enough to be given a six month kind of runway to actually plan and determine exactly what we were going to do. Um, the grant writing process was pretty quick. Um, when we found out about the funding opportunity, we had about six weeks or two months to figure out what to do with <laughs> the amount of money we were being offered. So um, we spent the first six months actually as a team uh, defining our use cases, 
looking at what stakeholder communities we would need to reach out to, um, actually doing some initial uh, fact finding with those groups and seeing kind of what the needs were um, out there. Um, you know, did some work on some initial, you know, interface mockups to just think about what this looked like and what we wanted to do. Um, and then in uh, July of 2018, we started our first phase of work um, in software development. Um, so the focus of this phase of development was really on prototyping the network functionality. So um, developing the, the necessary features to uh, synchronize the various nodes, as we call them, in the EASY network. Um, so exchanging metadata about what's been uh, created or published for others to see. Um, and then also the ability to actually replicate from other locations within the network. Um, and uh, we did some other work to prototype um, an authentication service or layer in front of the, ser of, in front of the software. Um, but that is currently ongoing. Um, we also began work with our initial institutional partners uh, who would be kind of the founding members of the Easy Network. So um, those include Carnegie Mellon, Notre Dame, University of Virginia, UC San Diego, and Stanford. Um, and we also worked on an initial metadata model for the description of software and uh, emulation environments within the system, which will be deployed uh, as a database as we continue to develop our software. Um, so we switched to this kind of shorter phases uh, earlier this year to kind of be more flexible and respond to changes in the project over time. Um, the last three months have been focused on uh, testing and release of a beta version of the software. Uh, so as of March 5th, um, the nodes in the network have been provided access to the software. It's actually public on GitLab, so if anybody actually wants to install it, you can, but um, as if you don't have access to everyone's uh, end endpoint information, you can't actually sync into the network. So whatever uh, details. Um, and uh, over the last six-ish weeks, five to six weeks, uh, we've been working with everyone to kind of iron out the kinks um, with the deployment and getting everything up and running and uh, getting making sure everything works, which is more challenging than you would think. Um, so I'll actually show off, hopefully, um, what this currently looks like. Um, so this is our current demo UI, which was created by the team at Freiburg. Um, and uh, it's mostly just here to show off the back end functionality. We're going to be working on doing a complete overhaul of the front end over the next few months. Um, but the idea being, uh, so you have the ability to, uh, well, so we use OAIPMH to exchange metadata about environments. Right now we can't do software uh, yet um, between the nodes. Um, and you can manually synchronize with individual nodes within the network currently. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because I've already actually synchronized this, but um, I've cur I have synchronized with the uh, running node at UCSD, um, which means that I now know what's in their uh, instance of Easy, um, and uh, thanks to Ron, their sysadmin over there, who's gone through our test workflow. Um, I can now see that they have this environment which uh, has a copy of Microsoft Golf installed in it. Um, and if everything goes as planned, I can replicate his environment to my node. Oh, well, yep, it didn't work. All right, this is what you get for demoing uh, software that's in development. Um, if it had succeeded, it would be in this list of public environments that um, are in the network. 
uh, and I would be able to run it, but it didn't work. So good to know. Um, I think there's still some work to be done on getting everybody uh, set up and, and some of the functionality uh, to configure. Um, so let's just imagine that this actually did work. Um, I could then just run the environment um, on my local infrastructure. One of the features that we're looking into is actually allowing users to um, retrieve the environments on the fly. So instead of having to copy all of the data locally before you can run it, you can instead just click run. And um, using range requests, the software will start to stream the data from the other node, cache that locally, um, and then uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, boot the environment um, without uh, without you having to even think about where it exists within the network. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a, an environment currently running on a server somewhere at Yale, um, and I can do whatever I want to it. Um, I'm not going to do anything because I don't want to mess it up. Um, and if I had made a change, I can save it and describe changes and it'll keep track of that for me over time. Um, so we're going to run out of time for questions, so I want to be really quick. And I know that everybody wants to get back, wants to get out of here so they can go get those drinks and everything. So um, what are we going to do next? Um, so we're working towards a production release sometime later this year. Uh, our big focus is on improving the sort of front end functionality for discovery and documentation. Um, we're also looking at a larger user permissions uh, uh, feature set. Um, so you can control who can do what within the system. Right now you can do everything, which is not great if you want to open it up. Um, we're also going to be prototyping a hosted version of the system. So if, um, if institutions don't want to uh, support the underlying infrastructure, um, for the time being, Yale will provide hosted access to uh, sort of a tenant tenancy um, within a, a hosted instance of the service. Um, there's all kinds of stuff still. We still have a little over a year. Um, so we are working uh, with uh, Catherine Skinner at Educopia as well to do some sustainability planning so that um, beyond what will hopefully be a next round of funding, we will be able to uh, continue operations. Um, and if you're interested, we are going to be expanding um, to more network partners this fall. Um, which will hopefully coincide with the release of the first um, production release, um, but otherwise we'll continue our beta testing uh, with those partners. Um, so a huge thanks to Melanie and Sloan. Uh, and if you want to learn more, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, check out our website on the Software Preservation Network's uh, space uh, or follow our hashtag. Uh, so thanks, and um, I've used up all the time, but if anyone has any burning questions, please <laughs> ask. <laughs> Thank you.